So, you know, we are going to talk about uh, uh, CCBs revisited. Obviously, we are going to talk about hypertension and CCB. But first of all, understand that today we have moved much beyond hypertension when we discuss about CCB. For example, this data came last year. This data came last year when we saw that calcium channel blockers, calcium channel blockers may be effective in treating memory loss in Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer's disease, calcium channel blockers. Yeah, the data actually showed that if you look at a healthy neuron, that blue is a neuron, and those yellow blobs there are basically calcium channels on the surface. If you look at the diseased, diseased Alzheimer's neuron, you see that is in gray color, and a lot of green inside. Those are calcium ions inside. And that is because the L channel, the calcium channels of the neuron increase and they push a lot of calcium inside. If you treat this patient with calcium antagonists, calcium blockers, you see that the calcium, those green blobs are less inside the neuron. The neuron uh, performs better because some of those uh, yellow blobs, the calcium channels are blocked. Not just in Alzheimer's, but calcium channels seem to have a lot of effect on even malignant brain tissues. For example, if you look at that picture, that's a glioma cell, a uh, 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 cerebral tumor cell, which again, the intracellular calcium, those red dots, dictate about how much proliferation, migration, invest, invasion, and character malignancy would be there in the cell. For example, if you block that cell with a, that is a voltage-gated calcium channel, block that channel with a calcium blocker, you find that uh, the proliferation, migration, and invasiveness of the tumor is far less. So the point is, we are looking at calcium channels far beyond hypertension, but we will first come back. Remember what we said in the beginning, keep that in mind, we'll come back to that. But we are going to discuss about CCBs and hypertension management in 2020, what is new. The first thing is, of course, the 2018 ESCSH guideline very clearly told us what, for the first time, they said that use two drug combination for Every patient that comes in, excepting unless the patient has got, uh, is very frail, unless the patient has borderline hypertension, use a combination of ACE or ARB with a CCB or an ACE ARB with a diuretic in a single pill. And if that fails, add up ACE ARB with a CCB and a diuretic, but again in a single pill combination. That highlights where we put CCB. Almost every person with hypertension today needs to go on a CCB. Now, if we move ahead two years and come to the 2020 International Society of Hypertension Global Guideline, that this came just now, a month back, and look into their guidelines. You've seen that. Dr. Sahani has shown you this already, that we start with, again, ideally, single pill combo. And in that combo, first step would be, first step would be a low dose of A, S, and A, R, B with a calcium antagonist, A plus C. The second step would be a full dose of A, plus CCB. The third step, ACRB plus CCB plus diuretic. And the fourth step, AC inhibitor ARB plus CCB plus diuretic plus pyrolactone. So you see that in every stage, there's in C. The CCB is there for every stage of hypertension. There's a reason for it, right? But before we go into the reason, understand an unusual, unusual epidemiological redistribution in India. Uh, this data that is from 2018, JAMA showed that hypertension in India, we have, the data is known to us, 25% to 107 million hypertension is responsible for 1.7 million deaths. But the point is not that. Point is this. Hypertension creates a debility uh, to the tune of 40 million. And that is what? Basically because of creating strokes. So hypertension is responsible for stroke now. With that background, hypertension and stroke, look at the data. If you look at stroke data, for example, this is a standard data we always see. The x-axis is blood pressure, systolic blood pressure. 120, 130, 140, 180, 170. As blood pressure increases, the graph progressively goes up. The stroke mortality increases. We all know that. Okay, look at ischemic heart disease. Same pattern. The SBP in x-axis, 120, 140, 160, 180. As it goes up, the IHD mortality goes up. Now, look at those letters on the right. What are they? The gray bar is 50 to 60, red is 60 to 70, orange 70, 80, and blue is above 80. Yeah, same thing for ischemic heart disease, which means as we go up in age, 
as we become older the graph becomes steeper and steeper and moves higher up which means both systolic blood pressure and age contribute to stroke far more in stroke because the stroke lines are far more steep compared to ischemic heart disease right now if you understand that look at the indian epidemiology we are talking about the population growth rate not total population total population in india is increasing everybody knows that but if you look at population growth rate in india it's progressively coming down we are getting smaller and smaller families but in contrast to that blue line if you look at the red line the elders some of the age of 65 it is gradually going up so from 1991 onwards india is becoming a top heavy elderly predominant society and the graphs are quickly separating so we are likely to see this more often in our practice and that is what the hypertension elderly mostly isolated systolic hypertension of the elderly isolated systolic hypertension of the elderly as we see the systolic blood pressure goes up and you have the age growing up so a bad mixture on your platter for stroke and debility right and what is the drug of choice we know that in ish i told us study hypertension of the elderly we have calcium channel blocker based therapy with or without diuretics are the drug of choice now pause for a moment we have learned so much from ambulatory blood pressure in fact we have so much of work on that right we have taken out blood pressure from the lamps of office and clinic in hospital out to patients home right and the first thing that that we realize we realize a lot of things but let us see the first and the main thing is that blood pressure is a variable parameter Now, if you look at that ABPM record, look at that night record. At night, blood pressure drops, and that is the normal nocturnal dip. Because the night blood pressure is governed by renin angiotensin system. Daytime we are all active and up, but the blood pressure is high. So there is a variability. Morning is high, night is low, and not just that. Early morning we have that sudden rise as we get up, and today we know that dictates. That is a vulnerable point for stroke and MI, right? so there is a variability some of it is good some of it is bad and now the point is we today know that if we give a ccb and a ras inhibitor combination at bed time that is perhaps the best in taking care of the night bp which is the most important parameters telling us about the cardiovascular risk of uh, blood pressure and also that morning surge so that strokes and myocardial infarctions come down now understand a little bit on variability you know we, when we talk about blood pressure variability that's a no, morning bp that's a night bp drop and early morning rise let's say the same patient bp of 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 days right so the dip and the rise that is a normal variability so the moment we say excess variability what comes to mind is this yeah which means the night bp is same but the morning early morning surge is significantly high so the variability is significantly more compared to normal but when we are talking about So variability we are not just meaning this we are meaning this that is every day's blood pressure pattern is different every visit blood pressure is different and that's why we call it visit to visit variability visit to visit variability and when we looked into the visit to visit variability effect on long term prognosis for example the uk tia trial very clearly showed that as the variability increased the hazard ratio of stroke increased when you looked into that 8000 patients of ascot for five and a half years time ascot bpla we found that both the stroke risk and the coronary heart disease risk significantly increased when there was increased variability so blood pressure variability is a bad thing we don't want too much of variability and that can increase stroke risk and coronary vascular disease risk we have data that came for the first time from rotsons group a meta analysis of anti hypertensive drug looking into variability and very very clearly we found this the ccbs are the best drug in reducing variability next followed by diuretics and then acrb and the beta blockers are the worst so ccbs are the best group of drugs that prevent variability of blood pressure and that may be the reason why we get so much of benefit by ccb now okay this theory does it all translate into practical benefit it does look at this data this data came in 2018 unique data is a 
Ascot trial data, but looked into the long-term mortality, what we call as legacy effect, right? So this is an 8,600 patients. It was basically Ascot group. So CCB-based therapy, it was amlodipine versus beta blocker-based therapy. If CCB didn't control, there was an addition of uh, parindopril. Beta blocker didn't control, there was an addition of diuretic. So CCB-based therapy versus beta blocker-based therapy. And trial was stopped after five and a half years when we showed that CCB-based therapy was better, right? But then look at this. Look at this. Now, this is coronary heart disease death. And the trial stopped there, that straight line of red, at five and a half years, right? Now, the patient stopped the trial. They went home and continued their own treatment. And exactly 15 years later, we see that the red line amlodipine-based therapy had a 12% lower coronary heart disease death. 12%. But when we looked into the stroke death, yeah, that is five and a half years, the trial stopped. 15 years later, we found that there's a 29% benefit in the CCB arm, which says that if you start your therapy intelligently, very early, that has a significant legacy effect in prevention, particularly of stroke, stroke death. This is a hard end point, right? Stroke death. So, we know today that CCB started on a right time, CCB-based therapy significantly reduces stroke and stroke-related mortality. And that has been very clearly shown. Now, something very interesting and very close to my heart, you know, we, we did a lot of ambulatory BP trial. And this was one of those trials, uh, 16 of us joined together and did. And, you know, this is one of those largest ambulatory BP trials in the world that came in the of human hypertension. We found something very funny. 27,000 patients. We found... Masked hypertension accounts for about 20% patients. What is masked hypertension? That means in your clinic or your office or your hospital, the patient's BP is either normal or slightly elevated. But if you do an ambulatory blood pressure or home blood pressure, at home, his blood pressure is significantly elevated. Masked hypertension is just reverse of the white coat effect, just opposite of the white coat effect. Now, what is interesting is here. Now, for a moment, pause about ambulatory BP. This is data from dementia. Right. What was found that if you look at patients of dementia from age 60, 70, 80, 85, you look at that 70, right? And that red line is vascular dementia. As vascular dementia progresses, the blood pressure tends to come down. The yellow line is non-vascular Alzheimer's dementia. As Alzheimer's dementia progresses, the blood pressure comes down. Why does it come down? We don't know. But this data has been supported over and over and over again. Maybe because loss of sympathetic tone, maybe because of loss of renin angiotensin axis, maybe autonomic, maybe they take less food, maybe their muscle mass comes down. We don't know. But the point is blood pressure comes down. So as it becomes a florid dementia, your patient's blood pressure may be normal. And by then, you have missed the bus. So the important, this is one of our patient data. In fact, we have, this is one of our favorite topics we talk about. For example, you see that is the night data. So I put it in red and you see that the blood pressure is elevated at night. But look at the daytime BP, normal, right? Normal, below normal. So nocturnal elevation of blood pressure, mass hypertension is often goes unrecognized if you record blood pressure in office. But these patients many often show left ventricular hypertrophy, still TIA and some kind of brain damage. Now, the point is, that is what we talked about. Our day, our, our, our review article came in Nature, uh, JHH, in May 2019, which we talked about hypertension and dementia. Now, the point is, this is not gross dementia where a patient comes in a wheelchair, unable to talk, walk, and vacant looks. No. This is a patient who would come to you who had borderline hypertension, but his wife would say, Sir, now he forgets everything. He forgets where he put his wallet, his mobile phone, he loses, his spectacles, he forgets, forgets anniversary dates and phone numbers. And the man would say, No, sir, he is, he is just fooling around. I have so many things to remember. And if you put him through a mini mental scale, you will see that they have MCI, minimal cognitive impairment. And at that point of time, if you do an ambulatory BP, and you find a nocturnal hypertension, unless you treat that, the patient will go in for frank dementia when the BP would come back to come down to normal, treat, there would be no significant benefit. Do we have proof? Yeah, a lot of literature now talking about dementia risk and the role of blood pressure pattern. And we have very clearly seen this is a large data that came in JAMA last year, which shows the association of midlife to late life blood pressure pattern and dementia. So they looked into dementia probability. And what did they find? They found that the blue line means midlife hypertension, late life hypotension, what we talked about, has the highest chance of 
dementia. Yeah, they have the highest chance of dementia. Okay, so what did we learn from the CCB that we are talking about? The CCB learns are one, CCBs control blood pressure. They are very good for isolated systolic hypertension in the elderly. A group in whom systolic blood pressure is high, they are elder and they, because of their age, they are highly prone from, for target organ damage like ischemic heart disease and stroke. Point number two, CCBs might improve cognition, as we know today, beyond controlling blood pressure. Do we have large data? No. But the signals are quite good that we have additional benefit of neurological protection, perhaps from dementia or whatever cognition, uh, apart from blood pressure control. And the good thing is that, for the, for example, the ISA guideline has stage 1, 2, 3, 4, wherever you are, there is an calcium antagonist. CCBs reduce blood pressure variability. They're the best in reducing blood pressure variability. Mass hypertension is linked to dementia. Mass hypertension, understand that mass hypertension is about 20% in India. But in the, in the Caucasian population, Europe and US, it is only about 7 to 8%. And that is why most of the guidelines till recently did not even mention them. They, they just neglected it. But we have pointed out very clearly that mass hypertension and dementia is important in India. Don't forget that. And of course, CCBs and RAS inhibitors, the first line combination, tends to control the nocturnal blood pressure and early morning surge and might control a lot of these uh, ravages of hypertension. Now, how do we choose a CCB? This is the last part, right? How do we choose a CCB? We know that the voltage-gated calcium channel are three types. One, the L-type, the long-lasting type. That's why it's called L-channel. Nifedimine, amlodipine, and of course, the non-DHP blockers block the L-channel. Diltiazem, verapamil, and other effects of the, of the conduction system also. Now, the T-channel currents, or the transient current channels, for example, selenipine blocks L plus T. And then, of course, we have the N, or the neuronal channels. Uh, drugs like benedipine and azlenidipine blocks L plus N. So the point is, is there a benefit in this additional N and T block? Yes, there are. For example, if you look into the L, N, and T type channels, right? And you look at the practical outcome. One is that there's a tendency for the sympathetic nervous system to be less activated when you add up a T or an N, particularly the N to the, to the voltage channel, the, to the L channel. That is because the sympathetic neurons have these uh, channels and they are blocked. And second is because the efferent artery of the glomerulus has the N, N channels. As you block them, there is a reduction of intraglomerular pressure. And thirdly, as you can see there, aldosterone secretion is reduced. So, how do we select a calcium antagonist? It is not potency. Many people think it is potency. It's not potency. It is the TP ratio, the traffic ratio. So any traffic ratio more than 50% is good. You might say, what is TP ratio? TP ratio will look at the clock time and the dose. We know, let us say, we have two drugs, right? One is a very strong drug. It's called a red drug. The red drug reduces blood pressure on dose at the peak performance, 10 millimeters mercury. But at the fag end of the day, the effect obviously comes down. Any drug, it comes down. It reduces blood pressure by 4 millimeters. So the TP ratio is 4 by 10 into 100 or 40-45%. Another drug which is much weaker. Weak drug, not good, right? That's what we would think. 5 millimeter reduction only. But at the end of the day, it has still 4 millimeters BP lowering effect. So the TP ratio, 4 by 5 into 100, that is 75%, right? So the point is, it is not just the potency of an antihypertensive drug that is important, but it is important that we have a TP ratio of at least more than 50%. And if you look at all the calcium antagonists with the TP ratio, and we find that there are a couple of them who have got significantly high TP ratio, and there are or benedipine, which, which has a good TP ratio on a single daily dose. Now, what about combined L and T and L and, L and N? Do they have a practical benefit? Yeah, yeah they have some benefits, uh, like slowing heart rate. This is important because the India Heart Study, which we had done with 18,000 patients, very clearly showed that in India, we have a faster heart rate. The average heart rate of the Indian hypertensive is 83 beats per minute. Compared to Western, it is higher. So and since we are not recommending beta blockades earlier in our, in our, in our uh, algorithms, so uh, calcium antagonists which would take care of the heart rate would be better chosen rather than one that produces reflex tachycardia. Reduce intraglomerular pressure. If you add N or T, 
you get reduced intracranial blood pressure. Then, of course, lower aldosterone levels if you get give a combination of LMT or LMN, like uh, the newer calcium antagonist. You know, so before we end, understand the, the reason why we are all talking about dementia. A record of 16,927 dementia patients went missing in Japan in 2018. And then they started thinking. And this is the graph. Look at the prevention, uh, the, the prevalence of dementia in Japan. Women and men, you know, men at least is plateauing down. Women after a certain age is significantly high. The, the x-axis is age, right? So what they did was they created groups in Japan. We just sit together and talk about dementia. They created trackers. So elderly people moving around that put on trackers so that you can track where he has gone. He's not lost. They created orange colored dress and groups. We roam in the daytime on the streets or in the shopping malls trying to find out if an elderly is lost because there's a lot of dementia. And they are now planning to put beyond a certain age, everybody's thumb uh, barcode so that you find somebody roaming around in the street, he doesn't know his address or home, can quickly find out all his details. Obviously, can we do that in India? We can't do that. We can't do that, obviously. This is our OPD, right? Where people are standing with a token to enter my room. So, you know, our blood pressure record is different. The people standing in a queue. All our hospitals are like this. So, Western situation doesn't match. But understand that today, the incidence of dementia in India is 2.7%. And when you link it with hypertension, the problems become huge. And if you can control hypertension, for example, with a good drug like CCD, you can prevent long-term dementia and a lot of these neurological sequelae. So I always say that our problems are different. Our solutions too need to be innovative. So, so don't lose your curiosity. Uh, thank you for your time. And uh, uh, I think if some, there are some questions, we'll take it.